so glad that we're not alone in this life. Praise God. You know, one of the greatest things that we get to do before we have our worship and our praise is we get to have some fellowship and to get to hear testimonies from other brothers that have been telling of the goodness of God. And God is good. And God will do it. Every time. And God will do it. Every time. There we go. I thank him for the victory tonight. Yes, sir. He is worthy. Yes, he is. He is worthy. Yes, he is. When all I 
about that battle because the word says that there's no weapon formed against us that'll prosper. Preach it. I will. I'll preach that. No weapon formed against us will prosper. If we trust in the Lord, I like it the way Proverbs says it. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Come on Lean now. not unto your own understanding, but in all thy ways acknowledge him. And he will direct your path. If you don't know what to do, then just acknowledge him. If you don't know what kind of decision to make, then just acknowledge him. Trust in the Lord. Amen. He is worthy. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Darkness falls, 
won't prevail Cause the God I know knows only how to try And my God will never fail No, my God will never fail I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. Amen. Amen. Can we just lift our hands in this place tonight? If there's anything in your life that you need more than anything, it's Jesus. Brother Nick is going to sing this song in a little bit called Nothing Else. We have to get to that place, men, where sometimes we got to get empty. You know what I'm talking about. We got to get empty. We got to let go of that pride. We got to let go of the ego. We got to let go of the machismo. You know what I'm talking about. Some of you guys, all right. There's a lot of things that we need to let go. Once in a while, you need to tell your wife she is right. You are stubborn. You do need to get down on your knees and ask for forgiveness. But I thank God. If there's anything in our life more than what we need is nothing more than Jesus. Amen. Jesus will change a lot of things. Yes. But the most important thing he's going to change you and me. That's who he's going to change. You and me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Listen, man. There's a point in your life where, where you might ask God to take you back to where you started. Remember that moment. Remember that moment when he changed your life forever.
nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment. Never want to leave. Oh, I'm not here for blessings, Jesus. Jesus, you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey Amen. Can we have the ushers get in place, please? We're going to pray over this offering real quick. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Father God, we just come before you with thanksgiving in our hearts, Father God. We want to give you all praise and all glory for all things and everything, God. We ask your blessing on this offering, Lord God, that you would be glorified and exalted, but most of all, it would be used for the furtherment of your kingdom. Lord, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We ask for your blessing on every person in this building. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. Woo! Come on. I search the world. Empty praise, treasures that fade are never enough. That's right, come on. Then you came along and you put me back together. Every desire is not satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better.
of stuff that takes place in that spiritual warfare. I want to share with you a story that um, uh, in Scripture that seems when you look at it, uh, when you're reading it, when you're hearing it, you would think, you know, from that perspective, there's no hope. How can that happen? That's impossible that way. Um, but then there's what God says and what he does that way. So I want you to turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. God gave Ezekiel a vision. He gave Ezekiel a vision in Ezekiel 37. I'm starting with verse number two. And when he's given them this vision, he says this. This is what Ezekiel says in 37.1 when God has given this to him. He says, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out by the spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Let me stop there for a minute. The Lord had showed him and told him that these dry bones in reality were the condition of the Israelites. They had turned from God, they were, they were away from God and they were separate that way. So he showed them this, uh, this, uh, this vision that this was the condition of the, of, the, of the people, the house of Israel. And the bones were obviously dried up and, and good for nothing. Their hope was gone. Even the Israelites, I'm not, you're not going to see on the screen, but even the Israelites spoke themselves. They admitted it in, uh, in Ezekiel 37, 11, where they themselves said that our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. So they themselves said that, that they are cut off that way. So just imagine the scene right now where God takes him to the valley and he sees these bones that are dried up uh, and spread out across the valley. Bones everywhere. You know, there's a skull, there's a thigh bone, there's piles of fingers and legs and, you know, bones, all, all kinds of bones everywhere. They're scattered. Uh, uh, they're in disorder. They're dry. They're dead. Not even the predators in reality like dry bones. They're good for nothing. Dry bones everywhere. So the Lord was telling him that there are people that are in that condition. He was telling them. The people are in that condition. That's why he showed them that. He goes, there are people that are, that are living their lives and they're like those dry bones, just like that. So he had to show them that to understand what he was going to have them say and do. He, he, had, to, he had to show them that, this, this vision, and to show them, for him to, to paint the picture. That's why I want you guys to paint this picture of a valley full of dry bones everywhere like that. And the Lord is telling there's people that are, that are living that way. They're cold and they're indifferent. They're away from God. And that's a spiritually dead. Because there are dry bones that are spiritually away from God. There are people that you would think, how could you even say that? Oh, there's no God. And I don't do this and I don't do that. God can't do that. And there's people that believe there's, there's some people don't even believe there's a God. So when you, I mean, from my belief and my faith in Christ and the word of God, I'm thinking, how is, that, how is that possible? But there are people that are dead that way. There are people that are still in backslidden state that have tasted of the love of God and ran from God, turned from God, and they're in a backslidden state. The Lord himself says he's in love with the backslider. So when you look at the world today, we're in the exact same position right now. Away from God. People are away from God everywhere, all over the place. People tend to celebrate what is evil and condemn what is good. They'll celebrate evil and condemn what is good. It's, it's, just, it's, 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 the, it's the craziest thing. They will value reason as opposed to faith. They'll look to the things of, of the world instead of looking to the things of God. They'll look for demonic spirits for counsel or understanding before looking to the word of God. The world in reality is in bad, bad shape. There was a stench that was rising in that valley. It smelled. There was a stench that was rising. It was, once again, paint the picture. It wasn't a pretty sight. You know, somebody once asked me a while back, it was a sister, she said, um, and I, I wrote it down, I quoted exactly what she said. She said, pray for my husband to be saved. He's a good man, but he needs Jesus. So she's seen the character of the man of physically, maybe the attributes of the man, his integrity that way. But in reality, he was not good because spiritually he was dead. I don't care how much you do in reality for the kingdom, 
if you're spiritually dead. Because a lot of people are getting busy and doing stuff, but they haven't had an encounter with Christ. A lot of people are busy in the kingdom work, but have not had an encounter with Christ. Stay with me. You know, we don't, we don't, we don't need politicians that are good. We need politicians that fear God. That's why on a daily basis, I call out, and you've heard me say it before, I call out specific politicians' names that I think are demonic. I call them out by name, and I pray that whatever it takes, they will come to a, a position of repentance, and they will stand in repentance before God and, and accept the Lord as the Lord and Savior, and that the Lord would fill them with the baptism of the Holy Ghost and their names will be placed in the Lamb's book of life. But in reality, their flesh is saying, they ain't never going to do that. Quit praying for them. And I hear him on the news again. I hear what they're right. I hear what they're saying. And my flesh is saying they're not going to do that. But the Lord tells me, keep praying for them. Because we need politicians that are in love with God. Amen? Amen. So once again, here in this valley, here we're surrounded by bones that are like that. We're surrounded by people that are spiritually dead. Literally spiritually dead that in reality need to be resurrected. So in reality, how can we... Minister to the lost world. We know we can, we can say outreach. We can do all kinds of different things. But ministering to me is seeing what God sees and hurting over what God hurts. Seeing what God sees. So in reality, what I need to see, what we need to see, I need to be able to see that death. Otherwise, I'm going to just put them aside. Somebody else will, will talk to them. Somebody else will get them. Somebody else will encourage them or uplift them. Somebody else will introduce Jesus to them. Somebody else will do that. We need to be able to see death. Otherwise, we're not going to see, we're not going to understand the way God was saying to Ezekiel, I want you to see this so that you can understand what I am telling you. I'm needing you to see this so you can know what I'm trying to come across to you about how the people are living right now. And once again, he's seen all these bones that were scattered, dry bones. He showed the bones to Ezekiel. Once again, so the, the, the prophet, the man of God, would, would understand the tragedy. And ministry, I wrote it down here. Ministry is also trusting in God even when the situation looks impossible. When it looks impossible, we need to be able to trust in the Lord what he has for us. Because many times when we don't trust in God, we want to fix things the way we fix things, the way we've always done it. Somebody gets you mad, sock them up. Yeah, you, want, you, you, you need extra money this month? You, you know how to make money real quick. We want to do things the way we've always done them. But I believe that happens because we don't see death the way the Lord sees death. So God asked Ezekiel, he said, son of man, can these bones live? Now, I believe when he asked Ezekiel that, I know he's a man of God, but I believe he had a, his faith was a little bit low right there. He said, son of man, can these bones live? Can they live? And the, what Ezekiel responded back to God, he said, oh, sovereign Lord, you alone know. We all say, oh, if I'd have been, I'd say, yeah, God, you can do it right now. <laughs> but, but once again, I believe Ezekiel said that because he was looking at what was in front of him right now. And he ain't never seen no bones come to life. He ain't, he, and so now it's in front of him. So he, for him to say, yeah, let's, let's get busy. Let's do this. He, so I believe his faith was a little bit low. And he said, Lord, only you know. You alone know. Now in that sense, I believe the, the situation looked hopeless. And that's how many of our situations have looked hopeless. Sometimes when our marriage is going bad, we think this is never going to be fixed. But I guarantee you, the Holy Ghost will jump on people, jump on that, that woman or, or jump on you. And I guarantee you, it'll change everything. Those things that were so significant that were causing the biggest problem are no longer going to be significant that way. Yeah. If we will see the death and understand it and what it's actually doing. Are you with me? Because many times people feel there is no hope. <laughs> Does God only you know? Ministry is this. I put down this term. Ministry is this. It's repeating God's word. In other words, 
saying it because that's what Ezekiel did. God commanded Ezekiel to prophesy and to speak life. Look what Ezekiel did in 37, 4, and 4 through 6. Then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them. Now let me stop right there. He said, prophesy to these bones and say to them. Stop and think about it. Once again, paint this whole scenario. A bunch of dry bones everywhere, dead and everything all mixed up. Talk to them. Say, say, say this to them. Uh, you heard me say it. I, I love God, but I would have probably, I probably would have questioned that. Like, oh, I don't know. Are you sure about this? Because I'm not familiar with that. I'm not. It's unfamiliar, so to speak. So when God says, I need you to speak to all this mess right here, all this dead stuff that's right here, I need you to speak what I tell you to speak. Stay with me. He said, prophesy to these bones and say to them, dry bones? <laughs> that's crazy. <laughs> dry bones. He tells them, dry bones. Hear the word of the Lord. Man. You see that? This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath into you and you will come to life. Hmm. That's crazy. Verse six. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Amen. So in other words, there is help for those dry bones. <laughs> because in reality, Ezekiel did not know what to say to these dry bones. But God gave him the words and God told him, repeat what I tell you. In other words, repeat my word. That's what I'm saying. We need to begin to speak. We need to repeat God's word. They don't need people that are tore up and really, man, last, last string in their life. They don't, they don't need to hear man's ideas. They need to hear the word of God. They need to have an encounter with Jesus like never before. Because I'm telling you, gentlemen, if you have an encounter with Jesus, your whole life will change. You won't walk the same, talk the same, act the same, live the same. It'll change every aspect of your life. When you have an encounter, we need to repeat God's word. We don't need to repeat the words we hear on TV or on social media or on the internet. We don't need to repeat that mess. It's all nasty and junk. It's all demonic. You don't need to repeat that. We need to repeat God's word. And I need to do that for myself because I am constantly under attack. We are, all of us are. That's why I asked you, are you some of you have a hard week because we're all under attack. If we have a difficult time reading the word and repeating it, something, you, I guarantee you, you're going to have a more difficult time. You're going you're to have a, a war on your hands. We need to know how to fight this thing. We need to fight it. Um, you're not going to get stronger in serving Jesus by going to the gym. I mean, that'll help, but the Lord knows I need to be there. But spiritually, that's not going to help you. You need to get into the word. You need to pray and fast. You need to see God. You need to repeat the word that you're hearing. Stay with me. It's very important you understand it to repeat God's word. But then there's so many that are spiritually dead. So once again, so Ezekiel prophesied as he, prophesied as he was uh, commanded. As he was prophesying, it says there was, the, the, word, the word of God says there was a noise. That's <laughs> crazy. Huh? It says there was a noise, a rattling sound that began to take place. And the bones began to come together bone to bone. So imagine how the bones have been sitting there for years and maybe Phrase have gotten them and eagles and birds have messed them all up and all of a sudden that ankle bone came and got it with the, with the shin bones and the knees and the arms come together with those elbows and everything started moving to come into place that way. Now, I think Ezekiel had to have something from God because I would have flipped out of ran. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just being straight with you. I probably would have ran. See, what's up with this? I'm out of here, man. Yeah, I'd like to say as a man of God, oh, I'd stand in righteousness before the throne of God and I would stand there. To, I, I would like to say that, but I probably would have ran. 
You looked at Seattle and said, man, Lord, you need to do something. I mean, CCW carries, you'd probably pulled, you'd put a drawing on them bones already. <laughs> you probably ought to already. You see, but bone to bone, everything started coming together and, and you know, the sinew and the skin and all that, but there was still a problem. Look at Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 37, 8. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. So they looked real good. They looked real. Imagine if God was giving them new skin and all that. It was brand new. It, it had to have been, I believe, perfect skin. It had to have been dead on, but it was still dead. <laughs> it was bones without without breath, like a lot of not, I, I, like I'm just saying, like a lot of dead churches. And I'm not saying we're the one, because I don't believe the church is brick and mortar. The church isn't the brick. So I'm not talking about that church on that corner, this corner, arch. I'm not talking about that. The church is me. It's you. It's us. So when I'm saying the church, I'm talking about the body that God has called, not the brick and mortar. See, there's a lot of church that's dead. Stay with me. Don't get mad. <laughs> then there's the brick and mortar. Then there's the organization. Then there's all that, that and the individuals as well, the, uh, uh, us as the church as well, all that aspect of that. It's real organized. It's going real good. Praise the Lord for that. But still, they're spiritually dead. Busy, but spiritually dead. Stay with me. There's, there's also entire denominations that are awesome and they're well organized, but spiritually dead. Stay with me. That the spirit of God is not moving the way it needs, that the, the spirit wants to move, that we're not allowing it to move because we want to do things our way. Right. If it's not done my way, it's not going to happen. Yeah. If we would allow the Lord to move, I guarantee you, man, he would. <sighs> well, let, me, let me tell you something. If, if, if the Holy Ghost was to jump on some of you <laughs> in a crazy way, you probably wouldn't be in here. You probably wouldn't be in here. You say, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I ain't got no time right now. I, I, you, you would see death. He said, look what I'm showing you, Ezekiel. You probably wouldn't even gather to an extent very often because you maybe be out there saying, go over there and you can go gather because you're, you're still drinking, you're still eating titi, you're, you're, in, you're still drinking milk. <laughs> So yeah, I'm going to be doing this, but you need to get in that body, which is good, the brick and mortar, go over there. But I'm going to be over here. I see death and I understand something. So sometimes you won't even gather because of the power of God that is in you and the zeal, the tenacity to do kingdom work for the Lord. Are you with me? Con organization and conventional success is awesome, but it's not enough. We need life. We need that breath. We need the spirit of the living God to come within us as opposed to just being busy that the spirit of God will come inside of us and we will begin to move like we have never, ever moved before. <laughs> Some of these individuals or the church, what I mean by that one is again, the body, the individuals that are called out, the, the body, uh, sometimes they move like zombies. You know, I entitled this message, The Walking Dead. <laughs> You know, we, you'll see it on, the, on, 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 the, on YouTube it's entitled The Walking Dead because sometimes the people that profess walk and seems like they're alive and they're moving sometimes forward, but they're dead. Wow. Are you with me? It's, they're like zombies. They look alive, moving around but they're really dead. It, it kind of, I don't have that on my notes yet, but it kind of reminds me of the, of the sermon I preached a few years ago. Maybe I'll come back with it again, but 
where I talked about the rock chuckers. I, I entitled it Rock Chuckers. So many times we go out of our way to invite people to church and come to, come to church. And you got to set a, a group of rock chuckers waiting in the lobby. Yeah. Well, the Lord told the woman that when was, she was caught in adultery, for, for those of you without sin, be the first one to cast a stone. And sometimes they're, they're, we're bringing the lost in and we're, we're ready to chuck rocks at them. But we're going to judge them. I don't like the way you look. I don't know why I like the way you walk. I don't like the way you dress. I don't like the way you smell. You know, I, I don't. And we're already rock chuckers waiting to come at them. In other words, we don't see, we don't discern death. We don't, we don't. We don't, we, don't, we don't see that. Many folks are just spiritually dead, but in reality, once again, they look alive, they look spiritual, but the Lord called those folks whitewash. He told the Pharisees, Sadducees, he goes on the inside, he goes, on the outside, you look good, you're practicing all the, all the law, the, the pharisaical laws, you look good, people look at you, look at a holy man right there. He's but on the inside, you're filthy. He told him that. He said, you're whitewashed. On the outside, you look good, but on the inside, he said, you're, 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 you're filthy. And so sometimes we, uh, how do we say, we default back to our walk with God thinking that just because we're so busy in church and we're so involved, when we go to church four times a week, we go to, uh, from one service to another service, from one Bible study to another Bible study, to a next conference to a next conference, to a next uh, uh, this and that, we think that everything's good and because our flesh is, that's good. Stay right there. You're good. That's good. But don't repeat the word. Stay busy, but don't tell nobody anything. Do not repeat the word. Because when you start repeating the word, you're going to see those backsliders, those people that have been running from God say, what did you just say? When you repeat the word, you're going to be see, begin to see life change like never before because that's not coming from you. The word has a power of its own. You can have a heathen preach and the power of God is still move because the word has power of its own. It's not based on the man or the woman. The word is alive on its own. I remember because like I said, I, I grew up as a young man. I got saved as a young man and I grew up in church and I was serving the Lord and I, I, I turned my back from God and I, I, I backed for 14 years. But when I backstayed for 14 years, I still understood what the power of God was. Just because I backstayed didn't mean I didn't understand that. I'd be a heathen, drunk, and all that. You need to go to church, brother, because you know what? Jesus will change your life. And I was tore up. <laughs> Craziest thing. And for whatever reason, somebody would go to church and get saved, and I'm still out there. The word of God has power of its own. Let me tell you, brothers, I, you know, me, you, you might be, what I said, like, I wrote it down like this, might be a spiritual zombie. In other words, walking dead. If you are spiritually stagnated. In other words, uh, you see, dead bodies, like I said, dead bodies, they stink. The Dead Sea has a lot of water coming into it, but it doesn't have any water going out. And documentation says that it smells, it stinks because of sulfur. It stinks because constant coming in, but nothing, it's not moving. It's not going out. It's not being poured out to anywhere else. So the water becomes stagnant that way. So if a person is in church all the time, all the events, all the conferences, and all the Bible studies that way, one thing after another after another, but we have no outlet. We don't pour out to anybody else. We're hearing powerful word, powerful message Man, I got blessed in that service. The worship was awesome. The, God, the power of God moved. And we go right back home to that remote, and we don't tell nobody nothing. We don't share what God has given us. We don't share the scripture. We don't tell what we learned in the Bible study. What is, you're getting spiritually stagnant that way because there's no outlet. The widow with the, with the oil says, as long as, she poured, as long as she poured the oil, the oil kept flowing, but as soon as there was no more pots to fill, as soon as there was no more vessels... Is the oil stop flowing. You see, we have to have vessels. The Lord sees, calls us vessels, you know that? We have to have vessels to keep pouring into that we don't become spiritually stagnant and become to start stinking. And you know what the stinking, in reality, what it represents is that when you, when, when you can talk a good talk 
as a whitewash. You can walk a good walk as a whitewash, and it's evident to the folk, but the inside we're not right. But when you become stagnant, when you're not when you're not pouring out that way, the stinking aspect of that is everyone around you is gonna is gonna smell you. They're gonna know. You can hide it from folk, but the first ones that are gonna know is your wife's gonna know. Your kids, your kids already know before your wife did. Yeah. Your kids already, they can hear what you're doing late at night. They know what you're watching. They're still up when you think, you're, when they, when you think they're asleep. And they know where you have your stash. You think nobody knows you're sneaking back in the garage or the back shed and stuff. And the kids already know your stash. Matter of fact, they're getting some of your stash. And we think, we think, we think nobody knows. So we become stagnant and we, we think we're doing real good. And some of the first evidence of being smelly is all of a sudden you say you love God and you praise the Lord speaking and all that. And all of a sudden somebody, as soon as somebody you get, gets you mad, you throw an F-bomb or you say something, people say, smell that. That's what he was showing Ezekiel. That's what he's, I need you to see death. I need you to understand what I'm telling you here. That's why I need you to, to, to have that tenacity to begin to speak what I tell you to speak. Believing that we're doing good, once again, by lots of church attendance and by all these things, by not, but, but not pouring out, we become spiritually stagnant. And when a person is spiritually stagnant, this is how I can tell as well. You can tell because they're busy and stuff, but all of a sudden, in time past they weren't, but now they're real critical about stuff. And they're looking for fault in everything that everybody's doing, anybody's ministry, or if you bring somebody up in leadership, they don't like it, or they're critical. Instead of helping somebody and encouraging somebody, they just want to bring somebody down. They don't like the idea that, that the Lord is using you in a way that maybe they didn't get used. So people are spiritually stagnant. I can, you can see the, how, 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 they're, uh, how they're becoming um, uh, critical and finding fault that way. They're always looking for something what is right or what is wrong that way. And they begin to make excuses to why they're no longer going to do that. They begin to pull away from certain ministries because somebody told them something they didn't like. They're not pouring out that way. Once again, you might be a spiritual zombie number two if you are spiritually complacent. In other words, dead bodies do not move. These are people who are living in a comfort zone. They're perfectly comfortable exactly where they're at. They're not being challenged. Oh, I ain't fasted in 15 years. You're complacent. Yeah. I can, I can tell you exactly. I'm not gonna, you don't have to raise your hand, but I can tell you right now where you do and don't stand. I'm not, I'm, don't raise your hand, but I can ask you right now. You know, how many people did you win to the Lord today? Don't raise your hands. Don't point anybody. You answer that. How many people? How many people did you win to the Lord this week? Okay, then how many people did you win to the Lord this month? Okay, how many people did you win to the Lord this year? You see what I'm saying? So when you look at it that way yourself, you know exactly where you're at. Yeah. I'm not trying to condemn nobody, but once again, I'm not here to make buddies. I'm here to tell you the truth of what the Word of God says. And remember, whatever the Lord puts here first, he deals with me first. I got to deal with me first. This is all for me first. The Lord just allows me to share with you what he's dealing with me. So this, all this is, is for me. We, we, you know, so we don't, there are people that are living in a comfort zone. They're comfortable just the way they are because, once again, uh, they're defaulting back to, well, I go to church and I pay my tithes. I, I, give, I give $20 this month for tithe. You know, I give... You know, I, I was passing out uh, food Saturday, you know, for uh, feeding friends. I was, on, we begin to replace that as opposed to our walk with God as a, as a personal that way. And then we begin to make excuses to why we no longer, all of a sudden, when we were in time past on fire for God, now we, we make excuses to, um, uh, we're no longer using our talents and our gifts you know, for our abilities that God has given us. We, we, we stop using those gifts that God has given us, even the trades you have. We stop using them for the kingdom of God. But you can tell that they're, they're complacent because they ain't got no problem using those gifts for that fine sister that needs help in her house. All of a sudden, yeah, God's involved in that. That sister, you know, she needs some new light switches in her house. Never getting dressed to do a side job. Now you're putting everything on to do that side job, boy. Yeah, Shh. everything, boy. Where are you going? Oh, I'm gonna go do a light switch. 
All of a sudden, their talents are up. You got all oh, your tool belt, you got everything, bro. <laughs> For the sister. <laughs> Amen. Some folk think they've already, you know, they have enough people in the church. You know, nothing wrong with small churches. But I would look at it, if you've only got 10 folk, if you're evangelizing, if you're, if you're evangelizing, you ain't going to have 10 folk. You're, you're going to, people are, you're going to, power of God's going to move. If you're, if you're out there telling folks, if you're, and some just don't, the, the body, once again, the church, I'm talking about me, the body, us, not the brick and mortar, us. You know, we lack compassion. Once again, I'm going to go quickly, I'm almost done. You might be spiritually, you might be a spiritual zombie. Once again, if you're, if you're, if you're spiritually barren, dead bodies don't give birth. We're not producing fruit. Yeah, we're not duplicating who we are in Christ. We're not raising up, we're not discipling, we're not teaching, we're not training. So we need, we need to have that multiplication so we're spiritual zombies if we're not producing, if we're not multiplying who we are in Christ to others. They might not be where you're at, but they still need to know Jesus. We need to, once again, that's how we know if you're a spiritual zombie. You're not, you're not producing life. That's very important to understand that because there's churches that just don't do that. You know, growing up, I once again, I grew up in a church that they just, there was, our family was huge. Our family was, took over the whole congregation, man, and all our relatives and everything. But they wouldn't evangelize. So I did it on my own. And I started reaching a bunch, and I'm not putting, patting my back, but I started reaching a bunch of youth to the point to where it was all kids from the high school getting saved, and we had to move to another uh, room, another building, because lives were being changed and we didn't fit. Because I believed in evangelizing and telling others of the goodness and the mercy of Christ. Not of man, not of Buddha. Not of anything other than Jesus Christ. You don't have access to the Father without going through the Son. That's right. That's right. Amen? Amen. Okay, I'm going to be done. Let me just share this. You know, there's a story that I, I, I put down here that I thought it was kind of funny, but it's good. It makes a lot of sense. Um, there were some fishermen that, uh, several, a group of fishermen, they went to the mountains and they went to a cabin and they went to go fishing, you know, straight up fishermen, real good fishermen. But also they hit a real crazy storm, you know, in while they were in the cabin, so they couldn't even leave the they couldn't even leave the cabin. It was a real crazy storm. They couldn't go to the lake, so they went through us. So on the fourth day of the trip in that cabin, they started bickering at each other. On the fifth day, they were fighting. On the sixth day, they were tearing each other's hair out. So why do so many churches, so many people that proclaim Christ, fight with each other? Let me tell you why, because in reality, this body, these churches, these are sitting still when we should be out fishing. The Lord says, I will make you fishers of men. So when the body does not produce, when the body's not moving, not the brick and mortar, but when the body's not moving and not fishing, it gets stagnant, it gets complacent, and you start getting a lot of bickering and anger and bitterness amongst the body because it's not out fishing. Are you with me? Okay, almost done. Spiritually living. Again, God tells Ezekiel this, to prophesy, almost done, Ezekiel 37, 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So God commanded him to prophesy, and suddenly breath entered the dead bodies. They came to life. They stood to their feet, and it was through the power of God. But it was the man that had to speak it. So when the dead bodies arose, the Bible didn't say, oh, there's God. Look at the Lord in it. They said, Ezekiel. Ezekiel! <laughs> it's God, but he says, I need you to speak. It was God. 
but it's going to be you. It's crazy. Huh? It's going to be me. If we will speak the word of God. <laughs> you know, God's army is supposed to move powerfully. So these, these soldiers arose as a powerful army. And God has called the church, once again us, the body, to be an army. Not some limp wrist punks. He's called us to be a body of Christ that will move in power and authority and begin to cast out demons, lay hands on the sick that they'll be healed. He's called us to raise the dead. If you repeat the word, if you will say what God has called you to say, that's, that's what God has called us to do. So closing last year's scripture here, Ezekiel 37, 13, and 14. It says, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord. When I open your graves and bring you up from them, I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, am the, that I the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. There's a shifting that's taking place right now, but remember, like we talked about last week before, there's adjustments that are being made right now. The Lord says, I'm doing a new thing. See, God is in the business of raising the dead, <laughs> bringing that thing that was dead back to life. That's the backslash. That's the man, the woman, that whole family is running from God. So in reality, it's time that we stop moving like zombies and start moving in the Holy Spirit. It's time. Just speak what God has called you to speak. I don't care where you're at. If you're at AutoZone, if you're at Starbucks, or if you're at a restaurant, or you're at the hospital, or if you're at your job, begin to speak. Because I guarantee you, every person that you encounter that does not know the Lord, they are dead. Period. And the spirit is yearning to be in God's presence. Every spirit a human being has been designed to be in the presence of God. So when you begin to speak life, the, the flesh doesn't like it, but the spirit inside goes. <laughs> because it's been designed to be in God's presence. So when you speak the word of life, the word of God into that person, you're speaking it to the flesh. It's, they're the ones that are standing there. But the spirit says, And they'll go home not being able to shake what you spoke. What the man spoke. <laughs> what the man spoke. Okay. Lord says, I'm done. I'm done. 